And good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us on our last day of technology week. We are so happy for you to be with us this afternoon. Um, if you've been able to join us on all the other tech days or even part of them, we are so happy you're able to do that. Please give us feedback on the tech week. Um, we'll try to send out a quick survey, just one or two questions about the format and if you like this, because if it's a series that um, a lot of people like and is effective, we'll try to do this in the following years. Um, so uh, look for that survey. And I'm going to write a note that I send out the survey. Um, let me do that. Don't forget that next week at 4.30 in La Crosse at the high school, we will have our first explorers group. This is for school librarians, public librarians, library staff of all shapes and sizes um, to come together and discuss the issues that you want to discuss with your colleagues and compatriots and fellow librarians. Um, CKLS will be there to get the conversation going if we need to but um, we don't need to be the ones leading the conversation. We want to hear from you and we want you to hear from each other. So that is the 26th of April at 4.30 to 6.30. Uh, CKLS will provide pizza and uh, dessert of some kind. <laughs> and uh, co uh, not coffee, but water and iced tea as well. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, also coming up in May, Oh, we Mary Beth, there's a question. Oh. Um, they, Amy I'm typing Otis an has, answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, board members can attend. Um, they're library-related folks, so yes, they can attend. Um, and then on the 16th of May, we're having another Explorers group. This one will be up at Logan Library in the Northwest corner. We're excited for that one as well. And then on May 24th, which is a Wednesday, we will have our full system board meeting. Um, the executive board voted to move it from online to in-person. So it is an in-person only meeting. It will be at the Dole Specter Conference Center in Russell. It's the hotel right off I-70. Um, if you park on the west side or the back side, there's plenty of parking and you can enter right into the conference center. You don't have to go through the whole hotel. That will start at 10. I'm not going to tell you when it ends, but we're hopeful that it won't be too terribly long. If you can attend, great. If you can't and you're the voting rep, make sure you um, get a proxy or substitute voting representative proxy form. Um, signed and sent in to me. I need that before the meeting starts. So at 9.59 on Wednesday, April 24th, or May 24th, I'll need that proxy letter if you have it. Okay, today we have our quick tech. We have four sessions from our lovely CK people. We're going to kick it off first with Michael and Aspen Discovery app. Take it away, Michael. Thanks very much. Um, as many of you know, we've had a new patron catalog since about 2020. And for a while, we've called it um, the, just the new patron catalog. But the official name of it is Aspen Discovery. And that's important to know, because as we jump into some of these things, that's a term that's used. So just so you're familiar with that. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of the catalog itself in the web version, so you can compare to the app version. Let's see. Give me just a second here. Okay. This is what the catalog looked like prior to 2020, or yes, prior to 2020. And um, it looks, it's linked directly to the staff side. So it looks kind of like the staff side. And then in 2020, the new catalog, not only is it brand new and it looks different but it also gives you the ability to customize your own personal library catalog and so um, if you want to view yours let me pull up a uh, chat here real quick i've got a link if you want to go to this page where you can select your library and view your library's catalog there's also a link to a document that shows um, if you want to go directly to your library catalog you can um, use one of those links and basically, you just type in your town's name or your USD number, and then catalog.catalog.cklis.org, and you can go directly to your catalog. 
but I'm going to go to the CKLS catalog here. And this is what it looks like. We like to call it kind of the Amazon experience. It's very uh, image driven and cover oriented. And you can click on a cover of a title to see more information about it. And they do have an app, which is what I'm going to show you here in just a minute. Keep in mind that the app is sort of still in development, and so it doesn't have necessarily all of the features that you would find on the web. So at this point, we're not necessarily pushing it out to patrons too much, but I want to show you what's what's in development and what it looks like so that maybe you can try it out for yourself and decide if you want to share it with some of your patrons. Let's see. For starters, you need to go to the App Store. I always need Jeopardy music as we're connecting here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we've got your mobile device and the name of the app is called Aspen, as in the tree, and then LIDA, L-I-D-A. And that stands for Library Discovery App. And you can see it in the upper left corner. It's gray with a multicolored logo. I'm going to go ahead and open that. And let me get logged out so you can see what it looks like to log in. They're going to log, patrons are going to log in the same way they would on the web. They need to use their library card number and their library account password, but they will also need to select their library. This is used by libraries across the country, and so they'll need to search. Um, right now, the only library from CKLS that is on here is the Central Kansas Library System version of the app. Go ahead and tap that. Put in their card number. Oh, bummer. I had it copied, but I'll just have to type it in. And this is the home page. You can see it looks similar to the um, the page that we're screen we're looking at on the web. We have what we call the browse categories, which are the featured book lists, and you can scroll down and see those. If a patron wants to see all of them at the bottom, there are some options to manage that. We can load more categories. And if for some reason a patron doesn't want to see one, there's a little tiny X that set in a hide button that they can tap on to hide one of those. And then if you tap on a title, it gives you some information about it. You may notice that this isn't as much information as you're used to seeing in the web. So it is a bit more limited in the information. I believe the idea is to make it clean and so it's not overwhelming but it does also limit what it's possible, what it can do. We can see that underneath the book image, there is the different formats and we can tap one of those. One of the advantages of the catalog that many of you already know is that it connects both physical items as well as digital items. So they're all combined together, which is really handy so that patrons don't have to search all of their different catalogs. They can just search this one and see what's available. Now that we're logged in, we can place a hold if we want to by tapping on the, the green place a hold button. It asks us where we want to pick it up. And so we can select any library to pick up the hold and it will get sent there. CKLS isn't listed on here because it's not a pickup location for most people. But I'm going to select the nearest one, which is the Great Bend Library, and place a hold. And the hold was placed successfully, and we're going to take a look at the holds page in just a minute. 
but so you can see even though it's not as detailed it's very easy for them to go in find to find something and place a hold on it it only takes a few seconds down at the bottom there's the um, menu bar or the you may be familiar with other digital services a lot of them have menu bars at the bottom and we're going to move from the discover to the search one of the limitations of this is it doesn't have an advanced search all you can do is a basic keyword search And then we can see the titles that came up at the very top we can limit it a bit by fiction nonfiction audience where it's available and format and then under each entry we can also see the different formats that are available for each title and of course you can tap on it to see details like we looked at earlier going back down to the bottom of the menu bar there is an option right here if you tap on the middle one that says card and this gives you a scannable barcode so if you don't have your physical library card then there's a scannable barcode however i have to admit this may not work for most of you because it does need a 2d barcode scanner and i've tested a lot of the barcode scanners we have and they're only 1d so they don't work very well on screens um, but definitely try this and see if your barcode scanners work because if this works it's a great option for people to not even have to carry their card with them uh, do we have any questions so far? We have a question about placing a hold for a, e -sun, a Sunflower eLibrary item. Can you do that through the Aspen app, but it places it on Sunflower eLibrary? Yes. And, and does you, it um, tell you if it's on Sunflower or Hoopla? Yes, if we go there to the ebook for this whale one, it does say it's checked out on Sunflower eLibrary, but we can tap the button to place a hold. Go ahead and do that. And if it's not on hold, you can actually check it out from here as well. You won't be able to listen to or read it in this app, but it, you, you can check things out here. OK, moving on from the menu at the bottom of the card, we're going over to the account. And it brings up a sidebar. And from there, we have options to see more things that are on our account. We're going to take a look at our checked out titles first. And here we can see the titles that we have checked out. This is going to show both physical items as well as digital items. So all of them are contained in one place. And it does show the due date in the little tiny letters underneath each one when it's due and whether it's been renewed or not going to open the account sidebar again. We're going to take a look at the titles on hold. And it separates the holds into holds that are ready to be picked up and holds that are some somewhere on the on the way. And so if you've got something waiting at the library, it's going to show up in the first section. We've got pending holds at the bottom and we can actually do some things with the holds as well. If we tap on one of the holds, we've got a couple of options. Um, if we do freeze hold, what that does is it basically um, puts the hold on, <laughs> puts the hold on hold. It, uh, <laughs> so if you don't want to pick it up right away and you want to pick it up in say two months, then you can um, have a hold that beca becomes inactive for a while and then it becomes active again when you set the date. And that's, they call that freezing the hold. And then, um, it, so it looks like you can't cancel a digital hold from here. You would have to go into your digital account to cancel the hold, but you can cancel a physical hold. If we tap on the, the detail there and then tap on cancel the hold, it tells us the hold was canceled. And if we go back to account, we can see, um, lists and saved searches. I won't go into those now, but that's an option that patrons have. They can make their own lists. I'm going to look at the reading history. And this shows patrons what they have checked out in the past. If you want to delete individual items from the history, they can tap on a title and then delete it at the bottom down there. 
Keep in mind, though, that deleting an individual item from here does not delete it from the staff view of Koha. If you want to hide things from the staff, you would have to go to the big red button at the top that says stop recording reading history and turn everything off. There's not the ability to delete individual items on the staff side. But if a patron does want to um, start recording their history, they can do that now um, so that staff One can minute, see One minute, Michael. Ah, thank you. <laughs> and um, they can do that by going here and turning on their reading history, and then that way staff can view it as well. And let's see, there's not really much under the more. That's just some technical details. So that is about all I had on the app. Any questions? Not seeing any in the chat. So we're going to move ahead to um, the Aspen help desk. Michael. <laughs> Tag, you're it. OK. Yep. I'm going to show you a, I'm going back to the web again. And there is a help site that um, gives some, a lot of tips on how to use certain things in the new catalog. It is primarily geared toward administrators so that there's a lot of information on here that you won't necessarily need, but I'm going to show you how to find some of the things that will be helpful for you and your patrons. And the web address is help.aspendiscovery.org. And right here along the top, we've got a lot of different things we can look at. Most of these we're going to ignore. But um, there are a couple of them, the users and the customize. These are things that might be helpful for you and your patrons. First of all, under the users, if we look at account settings, what you can do is click on each of these individual things here to open up more information. Some of them are just text, but the majority of them actually have screenshots to go along with things. And so this is if you shared this website with your users, or you could walk through it with them, it will take you through step-by-step -step things on how to do different things on their account. And it shows you where to find everything. Let's see. Um, messaging settings can be helpful. This, is, this shows patrons how they can go in and change how they receive notifications from the library. So they can log into their account and decide, I don't want to get notices every time an item is checked out. They can go into their account and change that. It tells patrons how they can go in and reset their library account password. So you can um, do it from a, as you're logging in, go to password reset, or they can, at once they're logged in, they can go into their account and reset their password from there. And it also gives instructions down here on linked accounts. This is where patrons can link two different accounts so that they can see what's checked out on the other one. Some families like to use that. And so it gives information on what they are, how to add them and set them up, and then how to disable and remove those. OK, I'm going back up here to the top. And of course, if you ever need help finding anything on here, I'm happy to, con to, to help you find things. This is just another resource if you, if you want a print tutorial for something. And, whoops, users. If we go to the checked out titles, there is some helpful information in here for patrons. This one is just going to show them the basic interface and how they can find checks out, checkouts on their account. There is a tutorial on how they can go in and renew titles from their account. And then it does show them how they can view recommendations based on a book they might have liked. So if they see a book in the reading history or one they have checked out, if they tap, if they click on, you might also like, it gives a few recommendations that are in the catalog that are similar to that title. And then it does give them a way to export their list of checkouts and so that if they want to save it for some other time, they can do that. Uh -huh. 
And uh, sorry, I'm going through this really quickly, I know, but I just want to give you an idea of what all is here. Okay, under users, if we take a look at the holds, and this gives more information about how patrons can place holds. If they want, if they for some reason need to place a hold on a specific edition of a book, they can do that by viewing editions and then placing a hold on a specific edition. It does tell them how they can find the holds in their account. And then it gives instructions on how they can modify holds, how they can cancel them, how they can freeze and thaw them, and how they can change the location where they're going to pick it up. As long as a book is on hold but hasn't been checked in by a library to go sent on the, be sent on the courier, they can change the location where it's being sent. Okay, some more under the users. If we go to lists, users do have the ability to create their own custom lists and they can make them either private, either private so that they are the only ones that see them if they may say want to make a wish list, or they can create a list that's public and they can share it with some of their friends or with other people. And this gives information on how they can do that. One really cool feature is if you go down here, list citations. So if someone's doing a research project, they can put all of those items on a list. And then once they have the list created, there's a button that says generate citations, and it will generate um, citations in different types of uh, ac academic formats. I would say don't entirely trust everything. Make sure they go through and double check the citations because based on how the record is um, created, it might not always be correct, but that's a very helpful tool to get them started. And then the final thing under the users, if we go to ratings, reviews, and sharing, there is actually a social aspect to the online, uh, the Aspen Discovery Catalog. And so this tells people how they can leave ratings on books. And once they've rated an item from one to five stars, it's going to show up for other people. The ratings are anonymous, but they are, um, you do see an average based on how many people have reviewed an item. They can also write book reviews. So if you want to write a book review, this tells them how they can write a book review and leave it on the catalog so that other users can see it. And um, there is a section on reading history. So if patrons want to know more about the reading history, they can view that there. Okay, any questions so far? Um, we do have a question about where were the citations um, option when I went to school? <laughs> um, we do have a couple for the app. Do you want to answer those or do you want to keep going on the Help Center? Um, I'll answer the, those. Okay. First one is when will the app be fully ready to use with all the libraries listed? That's Bywater has basically been working on it for several years and it's something that they continue to work on. So um, this is kind of our, our way to roll it out to you, the librarians first, to test it. If you feel like you, your patrons are ready to use it, we could go ahead and add your library on there right now. But um, we're kind of doing this as a testing period. So get in there and take a look and let me know what you think. And then the other one is when the Aspen app is ready for a full rollout, will any information be available to give the patrons like Hoopla bookmarks or other marketing or instructional materials? Yeah, I think that I think it will be. We can if the bywater doesn't provide those, then we we can make some. I'm making a note. <laughs> okay, and um, will you help us through this once the rollout is available? Yes, absolutely. That's what we're here for. <laughs> all right, and I think that's all the questions we have. Okay, let's see. How am I doing time wise? Three and a half minutes. Okay, good deal. The other section that I wanted to show you, and this is going to be more for you as the librarian and not for your patrons, under the customize section of the help center, this shows you all the different things that you can do to customize your, your local library catalog to make it your own. And so the first section here, browse categories, that is their name for the book. Um, 
the featured books list that go on the home page, they call them the browse categories. And this tells you all about how you can go about creating your own browse categories. So for example, let's say you're doing a Kansas display for Kansas Day, and you want to have those featured books on your home page for the, that month, you could create a category that goes just on your home page to show all those Kansas books. And this shows you all of the different ways that you can create those. You can create them either by doing a search or you could have a list of books and create a browse category from that. You can also manage them and you can schedule them. So if you want to show a browse category, say for the summer, you could just have it turn on automatically and then disappear from your homepage automatically at the end of the summer. And for all of these things, I know this is getting a bit more technical for all of these things. This is mostly to give you an idea of what's possible. I am absolutely happy to help you set these up. Um, and then let's see, back to the top under customize, we have something that's called placards in this uh, Aspen Discovery catalog. And placards are special boxes that pop up when people are doing searches for things that may not necessarily be in the catalog, but that you want to feature at your library. And so, for example, if we go into the library search and we do a search for Mango, Mango Languages is not in the library catalog, but it is a, something that is provided by the state library. So we did a search for Mango. And right here at the top, we have a placard that says, do you want to learn a new language? Mango for Libraries offers several language co courses, and it gives them information on how they can do that using a Kansas card. And if you click on it, it's going to take them directly to the Kansas library website login for Mango languages. And we do have a few of these placards set up for some of those state resources. But if your library wants to put some up for events or um, things like that, other special services your library might offer that people look for, the, the idea is to turn the catalog into a one place for them to search for all different library resources, not just cataloged items. One minute, Michael. Thank you. And let's see, going back to the Help Center, under Customize again, we have Theme and Layout. This tells you all of the different ways that you can change your library's theme. So you can change your logo, you can change the colors, so if you have certain library colors that you use and you want to make your catalog reflect that, schools especially may want to do this for their school colors. You can also change the fonts and you can change the contrast ratio if you're so inclined. And then the final thing under the customized menu, web resources. This tells you how you can add to your catalog a special page that shows web resources. And they do have some examples of what that might looks like, look like. And one of our libraries, the Salina Public Library, does have a page like that for their Aspen site. And so on their catalog, they actually have this page that they built that has other online resources they can link to. And again, happy to help you set that up if that's something you want to do. The idea is to eventually, this could be something for smaller libraries, especially you can use to replace your library website in the long run. Thank and, you, Michael. That's your time. Do you have any final comments? Were you asking me or others? I was asking you. <laughs> oh, mm, I don't think so. Just um, if you have any questions or anything about all this, please get in touch with us and let us know. There is one um, comment. Well, there's that's awesome. Placards are my favorite. And Michael, you are tempting us all with some fun, dangerous, crazy fun for those of us that are tech challenged. LOL. <laughs> all right. Next up, we are going to have. Andy, go over TechSoup. Take it away, Andy. Hello, I'm Andy Michener. I'm the IT manager at CKLS. And let me share my screen here. And tell me, tell me if you're having issues hearing me while I'm scrolling. Okay, sounds good so far. Um, so TechSoup is, uh, a way that you can get discount um, software for your library. And they have lots of name brand products available that uh, that are not 
cheap to buy on your own. So if you have most of our libraries, I'm pretty sure all of our libraries probably have a TechSoup account. Um, and if you don't have one, get a hold of me and I can walk you through getting it set up. It's too complicated to, and too individualized to go into doing that on this. But uh, I know a lot of our libraries have Microsoft Office on their um, staff and Patreon computers, but because it's so expensive, they don't get updated very often. I know a lot of a lot of libraries still are running Microsoft Office 2010. So, but TechSoup has Microsoft Office available for for um, Patreon computers. It's 36 bucks for one time per computer. And for a staff computer, it is $118 for one time per computer. So it's a, it's a little bit um, confusing. Computer labs means that they're available to the public to use. Um, what else do I wanna say here? Uh, installing Office now is very complicated. So if you wanna purchase new office products get a hold of me and i can come install them for you that's no big deal um i think we have i think currently there's like five days um after the the donation has been approved to, for you to purchase for me to come and install them or to or for me to get the uh, license keys to install office for you so that's something we'd have to schedule a little bit but it's no, it's no big deal for me to come up and get that going for you. Um, here's here's a list of their their donors or you know who what kind of uh, products are available. There's Adobe. They have uh, I'm sure they have all kinds of Photoshop and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they have Photoshop and Acrobat Pro. Um, I know one that. A fair few libraries use is QuickBooks, and that's from Intuit. And there's QuickBooks um, that's at a discounted price. Um, this is a little confusing. I think I think Intuit is going to a yearly subscription model, um, so it would be seventy five dollars a year. And their the yearly stuff the yearly stuff is a little bit different than their old. Um, desktop program. So it's a little, if you have stuff set up a certain way, it may not work the same way. So that's something you, if you're interested in, we can explore and, and see what, if, if that might work for you. Um, I was just going to add to that. Yes, QuickBooks is moving to an online subscription version. And unfortunately, unlike Microsoft Office, which has also moved to that, they are not offering a one-time purchase um, license where you can keep it for several years and on all that. So yeah. keep that in mind if you are a QuickBooks user that um, you will need to purchase a subscription license. And they their stuff is pretty easy to to renew. At least it's not monthly. Um, there's all kind, you know. The, I would recommend if there if there's something that a patron has expressed interest in having your library get, you can go to the TechSoup website. It's just TechSoup.org, and you can explore the catalog for looking for all kinds of all kinds of different stuff. Are there, there's even go ahead. go ahead i was going to ask about antivirus or malware yes there is some antivirus stuff i think norton is on there yeah excellent thank you mm -hmm. and there's i'm sure there's other other stuff thankfully we don't have yeah there's a vast too there's thankfully with windows defender there's not really a huge need to have aftermarket antivirus stuff anymore. Yes, that um, Windows Defender has really come a long way 
And um, I'm happy that we don't have to do additional antivirus. There is a question. Is TechSoup yeah. a subscription that each library pays for? If you have an account or get an account, can you browse the site without having to pay a fee to see if something the library would be interested in investing in? So it's not a paid subscription. What it, what they do is um, they check your nonprofit status, I believe is what the main thing they look for. I think there's a, should have looked at this a little bit closer. <laughs> I think there's a way to look for what, what kind of information they are looking for. Yes. Um, I know I've helped some some libraries recover the TechSoup accounts. Um, and I think I've helped, I know I've tried signing CKLS up for TechSoup, but we don't qualify for, for it. So, but I think they ask for an employer identification number and your 501c3 status, possibly depending on, oh no, they look for your, uh, what's it called? The Institute of Museums and Library, some IMLS. IMLS. They yes. look for your IMLS number. Mm -hmm. And there's um, ways to look an, that up. Yeah. If if you have an IMLS number, I'm pretty sure they don't need anything else from you yeah. other than maybe your EIN, but that's all information you should have access to easily. And then once you're once you're once you have an account, you can you can purchase the products from them. Now the different products are delivered in different ways from TechSoup, but TechSoup has a lot of resources for how to install their products at their discounts. And they also have lots of lots of information about uh, just general general computer stuff too. Yeah, so TechSoup is really good. It's a membership, basically. Um, you can browse the catalog without joining or signing in, but to do any purchasing or anything like that, you do need to have a membership. Um, it's been a few years since I've done it, but it used to take a few days to weeks for the membership to get authenticated. Yeah. Um, and I think that's still the case. So um, give yourself plenty of time for this. <laughs> yeah, it's, if you, if you're not sure you have a TechSoup account, um, give me a call and we can go, I can remote in and see if we can figure out um, if you had one at one point in time, if we can recover it or if we need to make a new account for you. I don't think, I don't think I've ever had an issue with a library that had, that lost permissions to their account, to their old account, created a new one. So usually it's not that big of a deal to, to get signed up for TechSoup. It's not, it's not hard to do. There is a question. If we don't know who makes the product we want, can we search by the product name or do you need to search by the um, maker? I believe there's a way to search by the product name. Yeah, there's a search. Okay. Products and search. Make sure that works before I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And you can see here, there's some different ones, uh, different oh. versions of it that um, popped up than what um, he yeah. found in the first search because there's so many different versions of things. So when you're ready to start thinking about this, keep Andy in the loop because again, like if you're doing Microsoft Office, there's some timing things that he needs to be able to make sure he mm -hmm. gets all the information in that time frame. So and make um, sure you select the right product to purchase so you yes. don't end up accidentally getting the one you have to pay monthly for or yearly for. Yes, and Andy's so. gonna be very good to make sure you get the right one. <laughs> okay, any, any other questions? I think it's worth updating at least Microsoft Office for for uh, your page computers, um, just because so many people know how to use it and it's so ubiquitous that you know sometimes people can get by with with Open Office or Google Google Sheets or Docs, 
but it's not always intuitive to everyone. And there's, like I said, there's, there's just so, it's just so ubiquitous that it's, it's a good, it's a good investment for your library to, to keep that up to date. And Andy, one of the things I remember when I was first re-entering the job market is I had to practice to take tests on Microsoft products. And I was so thankful I was able to go to the library to do those. So that's one mm -hmm. reason to keep them up to date for your patrons. And another thing, um, if if $36 is too a uh, computer is too much, you can set aside one or two public computers and say, this is our Microsoft Office computer. Correct. Yeah. And that way, at least one of those computers is available for that need. I don't really have anything else. Like I said, just feel free to contact me if you have any questions at all about this. It's really not that hard, but it's a little bit, it's individualized, I would say. So, yeah, and we can help you with that, no problem. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andy. All right. Next, we have up. Liz and her cool apps. Liz, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. <laughs> can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Yay. Okay. Hi, everybody. I have a long list of apps. We're not going to get through them all. I can guarantee that, but that list of apps will go out. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start screen sharing and let it take its sweet time as it does. You can see my baby dookie doo. Uh, <laughs> But we're going to go ahead and dive right in. The first app I want to show you is the Merlin app. This is really cool. Missy got me on this. Um, this is by the Cornell Lab. And so they um, help identify species of birds that might be in your backyard based on their sound or photo ID. Um, I've done several recordings. And I can't do any right now because I'm already using my microphone. So I can show you one where we had quite a few just and this is just in my backyard and you can see it's kind of quiet but you'll see the little pips of sound and when you're recording it will bring a bird on the screen and it'll highlight each of these birds. So like if the house sparrow is going, um, it'll highlight that that's as you're recording. Unfortunately, it doesn't do that after you've recorded it. But that is um, Merlin. It's one of my favorite ones. And go back. The next one I want to go over is Cause Connect. Now this is something that Gail showed me. There's not a lot going on right now, but this is a way that you can sign up for volunteering in your area. Um, what you do is you log in, you tell them how many miles you are, um, how many miles you want to travel, what you're interested in, or get or to get volunteers, like Gail says. And what you can do is after you sign up and everything, say find something to do. You can do filters and search within a certain distance of where you're at. Um, select your interests like advocacy, childcare, education. There's a whole slew of items that you can select your interests and you can even pick which agencies you want. So if you're looking for a blood drive or anything like that, you can go ahead and do that. And then you can save your filters and then let it search. Currently, there's nothing um, because it's a new app, but the more we get word out, the more people will hopefully join. And so that is Cause Connect, a volunteer Liz, app. Yes. Um, can you then do a call out for volunteers? Can you be the entity that wants to yes. find volunteers? Okay. Yes, you can. If you're an entity that wants to find volunteers, your setup will be a bit different. Um, and so you'll have to say what hours you need people, what your organization does and what you're looking for. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yay. Okay, this next one, I have two apps that to, are to do with um, organization. Todoist is for like personal organization. You can add members of your family to it. 
but you just go ahead and look at uh, sign in and you start adding your tasks and it's kind of like a personal calendar and I can go ahead and look at my upcoming tasks and I can check them off. Um, so say I had gotten some of this homework done, which I did get this done and it checks it off and deletes it from my screen. Um, it's really nice. You can um, select different tasks. You can look at your activity log, um, like what I've done recently, what I've completed. It's really nice to keep track of things. Um, and to add things in, you just hit this plus button and you can put in your task name, what the description is, if it's a priority, what, high, what level of priority it is, and when you wanna do it. You can purchase more, um, oh, more bells and whistles if you want, but I find the three versions of most of these organization apps work really well for me. Okay, the next one, Trello. Okay, I love this. This is a great organizational tool. So if you have a big project that you're doing, summer program or summer library programming, it has a bunch of different templates. And these are something that you'd want to go through and just kind of look at and play with. Um, but like for my cool apps, um, what you do, it works like kind of like a post-it note system. And you can add multiple people in your organization to each board. So like this little box is a board. This is a cool apps board. And these are the things that I want to do. Um, see staff association, I need to try to take over the world. Um, I need to let people know that they can run for upcoming terms and I can ask for donation suggestions. And if you see on that, there's a little comment. So you can open up each individual thing, look at all the members, see if you need to add an attachment or anything to it. And look, there was a comment, I, can't, I can't take over the world until after spaghetti night. So I know that I have to do spaghetti night first. So I'm gonna back out. And then another template that I kind of wanna show you, it's the same thing. Um, but this is an already made template, so you don't have to make each card. You can just go through and edit them. Um, so I have backlogs, I have designs, I have my to-do list. Um, what I'm currently doing in a code review, these are just things that are more for like coding specific, but again, you can edit everything, you can color coordinate, do whatever you want. It's a great thing. Um, where am I at on time, Miss Mary Beth? Five minutes, 40 seconds. Excellent, okay. So I kind of want to show you what the forecast. Patty, should I do this? Okay, I'm going to do this. What the forecast is a very snarky, okay, it's a very snarky app that tells you the forecast. I have it on the lowest profanity rated version, okay, so. I still can't control what pops up screen up on the screen, but you can change what levels of profanity you want. Okay. <laughs> Something wonky pops up. Don't blame me. Okay. <laughs> so PS, I farted on the meat Bob's burgers. It does quotes every page. Okay. Here's the quote for uh, Hutchinson. Today's forecast, sunshine, sunrise, sunshine, and some rubbish in the middle of the day. So that's pretty, pretty tame. Now you can go to your settings and profanity is minimal right now. It's the very first thing you can turn it off completely. And then you don't really get any quotes at all, or you could turn it on or some, or I like a little minimal because, you know, sometimes you need that snark, you do, okay. And then what you can do is it shows you the forecast. You can add different places. Um, so you have family and friends all over. You can check their, check their settings for the day. And you can even refresh. And it will come up with a, a new term for you. <laughs> okay, so that is what the forecast. Again, all these uh, apps will be going out to you. Now, okay. Personal favorite, mood fit. Um, I do, I have a lot of anxiety and depression, okay? Um, this is something that helps track your mood, helps you with mindfulness, breathing, things like that. I did this way early this morning, so it says I've already done it for the day, but I can go over and I can 
Oops. Home, what you do is you click on each of these each day. And maybe I think is history. I can look at my sleep, the nutrition, you do breathing exercises, things like that. And you even do like three little things for gratitude. Um, mood last night was great relaxing with a friend things like that and then you can put in daily goals there's a lot of tools to help you keeping in mind gratitude mindfulness even goes into cognitive behavioral therapy therapy which i'm a huge fan of i had psychology one of my favorite things helps you and gives you tools like it has um like this mindfulness these are actual audio um entries five minutes, 10 minutes that goes over um, some introductions to mindfulness and things like that. And it goes more in depth. There's a ton of tools on this site. I really love this. Um, now we go to the games. Okay, I know I have very little time left. I'm gonna go through my color friend. One, what? Two, one? Two one minutes, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So I have, a, a couple of colorblind friendly games. These are very hard to find. One is paid, it's 99 cents. And it is this, it's called Ruby Square. 99 cents, it's pretty cool. It's like Rubik's Cube, um, but, and I'm, I'm rubbish at this, I really am. You just push your buttons on each side to rotate, and then you can pick your square and you can rotate and you're supposed to solve it in as few terms as possible. Again, I'm horrible at this, but this is pretty much what it is. And then you can advance and then continue trying to beat it in the best way. Uh, and then it gets bigger and you have more squares. I'm never gonna be able to get to the one where there's like 16 squares, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> but that is Ruby Square, another one that I really like is um, Zen Color. This one, Gail, I got this um, idea from Gail and it takes a little bit to load, but I go to the Zen and I say this is colorblind friendly because when you, and now we have an ad taking up the rest of my time. Do we have Jeopardy music? Okay. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, these colors are all numbered, okay? When you push a number, it highlights the portion of that color. And you see this two circle that's on the bottom of the screen. I hit the two and it fills it in. And See how that's kind of small right there? I can just bring it up big and tap it. And the two, if you notice, it goes from one to four. The two has disappeared because you're done with that color. And Liz, it's really your time awesome. is up. Okay, well, there's a bunch <laughs> more, but you'll see them later, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, we will post all the links for um, Liz's apps um, with the archive that I'll put out by tomorrow. Um, and any other Liz uh, links that um, Nikki, Nikki, oh my gosh, <laughs> Michael and Andy becomes Nikki in my brain. Okay, Michael and Andy have to share as well. <laughs> um, I mean, we get questions for the other person all the time, so we could probably just roll with it. We're just going to create a Nikki and yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Anyway, so that'll be posted along with the archive that I will post out by tomorrow. Um, also look for that survey about this um, tech week and how it went and, and how you feel about it. Um, are there any other questions for any of our presenters on any of those topics?
I'm not seeing any, but feel free to keep typing in the chat if you are. Again, I want to remind you about the Explorers group that is on next Wednesday at the La Crosse High School at 4.30 to 6.30. Bring you and all your library friends. If they're related to the library in any way, shape, or form, they are welcome. This is an open format discussion. And then we also have an Explorers group on May 16th at the Logan Public Library in Logan. And we have the full system board meeting on May 24th. <laughs> It'll start at 10. It'll be at Russell at the Dole Spectre Conference Center. All right, Liz, for the Bird app, if you are in a service dead zone, will it still work? Okay, so for the Bird app, I think as long as you have your, um, and for the Bird app, you do have to have your location turned on. If it can't read your location, it won't be as good. It does give you the option to download uh, the bird pack for your area, which is just, it says it's the songs that are of the birds that are likely to be in your area. So there is a chance it will work without it, but it works best with the location turned on. Thank you. All right. For the full system board meeting on May 24th, we will have snacks, we will have coffee, tea, and water, but we will not have a meal. We will start at 10 a.m. I'm not going to give a time frame. I'm hoping it won't be terribly long, but if need be, we would break for lunch. Everybody would go find lunch of their own in Russell. There's several good options, and then we would come back and finish up. If there's bad weather, um, we would adjourn the meeting for that point, and then we would have to reconvene to do voting online. So we're hoping that doesn't happen. I hope to see all of your voting representatives, if that is not you that I'm talking to, at this meeting. Um, we have the system plan we are going to go over. We have um, some things that we really wanna get your input on. So if you can make it, great. I'm also gonna remind you that um, your system plan standard number one, is that your voting representative for your library attends either this May meeting or our fall full system board meeting. And the fall full system board meeting is where we go over the revenue neutral rate resolution and our budget for the next year. All right, anything else to add? Thank you, Cheryl. Right. I am going to go ahead and turn off recording.